there, welcome back to another set of shows. Uh, this week, I only have four shows round five because I'm doing a podcast with um, SGS Arts. Hopefully, he's had a few problems with internet when he's trying to do his live streams, but hopefully, I'll be sorted and we should be fine. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, so, if you see it up this week, you know it went fine. <laughs> if not, you know it didn't go too good. But that's uh, that's the plan. Is four videos plus that. So obviously I'm starting. If you can see my background, I'm starting with a Guaira Rafa God. And this is the beginning of my Herzog collection videos. My, 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 it's not. I mean, this comes from the Herzog collection. This film's in it, but other Herzog films. There's also documentaries and other films he made that are not in this collection that will also be covering. So it's not all just from this collection, but most of the 70s films are from this collection. So um, you will be seeing quite a lot from here. And this is a very good selection. You get all the um, films, you get commentaries. So you get his big films like um, Maguire, I forgot, all the Her Kinski ones. You've got the... Uh, Bruno films as well. You've got some of the other films like Heart of Glass and Fat Morgana, which I adore. So there's a lot of really good stuff in this collection. But you've also you can also pick up other films by Herzog, which is you know documentaries and some of his later fiction films. So there's there, there's a lot to go through, and I will be going through quite a lot of them. But I'll do I can have a series, and then I'll probably be kind of like the Palmer one where I'll do a bunch of them to start with, and then I'll pick off more as I go. Like I, I don't see me going through the all of these in one in one um eight or nine week run. I think that's too much stuff from Herzog, but I'm, i was I think I'm gonna try and get most of the big ones done and then I'll start to do the the, the films like Rescue Dawn and Little Detail Needs to Fly. Because that's obviously has to be a double bill since the same story. There's a lot of documentaries and things. So there's gonna be a lot of there's going to be a lot of stuff being done by on Herzog. It's just um, there will be a kind of central original series kind of based in this collection. And then there'll be a more um, spaced out, you know, selection of videos after that. It's not spaced out mentally. I, mean, I think I'm spaced out enough anyway. So, so Aguirre Rafa God was which which is the Herzog's first Werner Herzog's first major big film that he released. He'd done Fat Morgana and some shorts before that, but this is the film that put him in the map. This was the film that cemented his relationship with uh, Klaus Kinski, who was an actor who he really liked, even though everyone thought he was a nut. Um, and Kinski kept a lunatic on set, and he was very hard to deal with. So it cemented that relationship, cemented how good they were together, and how Werner Herzog got the best out of Kinski. So he knew how to control him as much as Kinski could be controlled. Because you can see in some other films, Kinski is sometimes out of control and the directors just get what they can with him before they throw him off the set. Here's a director who understands how to deal with him and to yell back at him and stuff like that. And So it became a very collaborative relationship all the way through the 70s. They made one film in the 80s, Copper Verde, which I'll get to, which I don't think is as good. I think they'd kind of gone through their um, I think they'd, they'd done their work by that point but this was the start Aguirre Rafa God was the start it was partially financed by um, German TV which is why it's a 4x3 ratio film a few of the early Herzog films are 4x3 ratio because that was a TV ratio and that's how he was getting his funding so Fata Morgana even though it's in no way it feels a TV thing has a 4x3 ratio as well and it's like oh was German TV very liberal then? Did they just show anything? <laughs> because some of this stuff is like um, just odd compared to what they normally show on TV. I mean, TV now feels like it, it always explains how it's more liberal and how it's more adventurous. But Aguirre Rafa God made early 70s here. It's way more adventurous than anything we've seen on TV nowadays. I mean, German TV, you, they would finance stuff with Fassbinder as well. So they would try and connect with a lot of major artists on some of the harder subjects. So it was, German TV in the 70s actually were seeing chances that we don't, don't even take now. I mean, they say that the TV now is really good, but a lot of the time, it, to me, it still feels very conventional and very much wrote and 
like it's ambitious in a very conventional sense. It's like ambitious within like parameters. You know, this thing, this thing is way further out. Right? This is the thing with very little dialogue, everything's very visual, and your lead character is a complete lunatic. I mean, of course he's a lunatic. He's played by Klaus Kinski. He has to be a lunatic. Klaus Kinski does not play sane characters in Herzog films. I mean, sometimes he plays sad characters, but there's always a kind of mania to Kinski. There's always this energy to him. And this is the one where he gets to play a complete monster. This guy is a lunatic. This guy is someone... You get the feel he was setting this mission to, into the Andes to try and find the gold in the Andes. You yeah, feel he was setting this mission because no one else could stand him. It was like, just give him to them. Just send him away here. It was like, you know, that's the kind of thing. You get a feel in this film that everybody who was setting this thing, they were greedy for potential gold, so they were the, the ambitious ones, but they were also the people that no one else really liked that much. The blowhards and the weirdos and the, the people stupid enough to actually go on this mission and think there's actually gold in this forest that is full of people who are, who are destitute. So it does, it takes place um, with the um, new world, in the new world where the old world of Europe is just coming over and trying to take over. So the Spanish and Portuguese all came to the Latin America while the North America was um, been focused upon by France and England. So they came over to the South America and they were doing their butchery there. Because this was, these were not like very civilised people really. These, these were superstitious people dealing with other people who were superstitious. But the Spaniards and the Portuguese thought they were more civilised. They weren't. <laughs> They're just the delusions of civilization. They just didn't understand the, uh, the indigenous culture and what they had and what they didn't have and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But this film just shows you them going through this landscape, which they've only got a vague map for. And they've only got these weird ideas of what the what the use of it is. And the, the, their idea is, if we actually get anywhere, we instantly own it. Like, if you see us, we own your land. We're conquerors. That's their view. And even with the land they're going through through the whole film, it's utterly useless to them. I mean, they're pointing out, like, it's just water. and even floods all the time here. You can't plant anything here. There's nothing you can really do. The river always floods everything. There's a shot later on where we see a boat in a tree because the floods have gone so high, a bloke is stuck in a tree. It's like, it's completely useless land. Yeah, you can see you've got it, but it's, you can't do anything with it. And that's the whole point, is that fool's gold. It's like these idiots thinking that they have the right to something and a culture they don't understand. With a society who has grown around the limitations of culture of the of the landscape and found a way to survive in it. And they don't. So they just keep on looking for this gold, which is just fool's gold. People have just told them this because... Like the locals have told them this because they think they... Just to get revenge, to let them go mad and go crazy in the jungle. That's it. It's just a revenge thing. And they've they fall for it. So why would someone tell you there's gold in these mountains? Don't you think they're pulling your leg? <laughs> so that's the whole idea of the film is these people going mad trying to find gold, trying to find fool's gold. That's the whole point. And Herzog really goes in for it because he's all about the crazy insanity and the crazy ambitions and the brutality of the time and, and the idea basically of He's going to stick with what they know. Like Herzog doesn't pull back and talk about... He's not a director who looks down on his characters and say, you poor fools. He lets you figure that out. He lets you see, like, yeah, from our point of view, this is foolish, but they believe it. And he always have the actors playing characters who genuinely believe they're right and genuinely believe they're onto something, which makes it all more tragic, but... Herzog does not go in for Grand Guignol um, emotions, tons of close-ups, tons of operatic stuff. He doesn't go into that. He just watches you. He lets you watch them do their thing and watch. you can work out where they're flawed and where their problems are. And he's all about obsessed with characters who are pushed to the, to the edge of society by the desire to basically leave their society and find something new. 
And well, that's I mean that's this one. I mean, the thing with this film is this is a film that typed Herzog is always doing those stories, even though we actually look at the films, he didn't. He was a person who had characters who were uncomfortable in the society. But they weren't just all adventurers doing this. But because this was so famous, this one film, it became all his films are like Aguirre after God. And it's really not the case. But this film was so strong that it stuck in people's heads for a whole decade because it was like, Kinski's mad. The, the, mad, the mad in the jungle. It's all crazy. All his films are like this. And it's like, no, they're not. It's just like, it was an easy thing for someone to see and it meant you could type them. So hopefully when I go through this series I can spell some of that. But this film is a masterpiece. <laughs> so it's it's really hard, it's so strong. It's such a strong start to a career. I mean one of the things Kensky always has is a sense of like self worth that's utterly unjustified. Cause he he says he hates himself too, but he's gonna keep going. He's this animal who keeps on moving forward. And yeah, says in this film, all the people here have basically risen just above animal level and they don't realise it. They're just trying to survive and they've got all these pretensions. And they've got all and they've got all these clothes that are of no use in this landscape, but they're focusing on this, like the worth of who's the commander, why are they the commander, how can they abuse the system even though everyone's starving. There's always a sense of that, that kind of that essential madness of, of vanity and humanity who who aren't taking their landscape they're in serious enough and that's a downfall. Like for the Kinski character it's almost like a utopia where you can live out your dreams and be a god and basically walk away from the society he feels shunned them. Which suggests again that he was thrown out basically. For another one of the other adventurers, a chance to make his name. For another one, it's a chance to um, get his name back because he was once thought of as great, but he turned out he's just lazy and slobbish. And you're never quite sure the stories about him were ever true in the first place. You've all, and they, they all bring their wives and their daughters, even Kinski. It's almost like they know they're not going back to society. And they've got all these weird pretensions of um, they keep a horse on the boat, even though it's pr no practical use. They've got um, they've got the, the other laws and they've got the courts of rules. Even though they're in a jungle, where it's it's like a, basically survive or die, but they're, they're ignoring the reality of what they're, where they're at. And it creates this sort of chaos throughout the film, and the camera work, and the actions and reactions of the actors. There's this sense of chaos, and Kinski's the centre of it. He's just this chaotic feeling of a character. I mean, um, Herzog doesn't tell that much about Aguirre, just that he's a bit power hungry. But there's a sense in Kinski always, there's this sense of chaos, he's bored, he's the bored. He's, he, he despises everybody, he's delusional. He doesn't understand what's pushing him, it's just this sense of chaos flying. He was unsentimental, but he's one people, he'll, he'll happily get rid of people if he doesn't like them or if they've slowed him down. He has no sense of loyalty. And there's this chaotic feeling throughout the film, this emerging chaos, it's always there. It's always at the centre of it, and it's always the sense of... The, 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 the jungle is just closed in on them at the start. I mean, the, start, the film starts to down this mountain. And as soon as they get down the mountain, you get a sense of this chaos. As the group realises they're way well behind. So they have this in their scout party ahead, which is Kinski's party, and all these people who we follow the rest of the film with. And they just slowly get lost in the jungle and slowly go mad. And it's just this sense of approaching madness. But it's not like the kind of madness that Coppola did with Apocalypse Now, where it was much so try to be literary about it and be more um, above it all slightly. This is just a sense of madness in the interactions and the madness in the way people act and not trying to pretty fight. It's just like, we're going to show you what they do and you're going to see it's pretty crazy in the context. And just people win a context and you've seen them being crazy and you're thinking, this is not good. And it's just this escalation of people them not paying attention to where they are. And they're not paying attention to what they're doing, what their motivations are. It's just that I want this, I'm doing this, rather than, should we think this through, should we? 
No, because you're not the commander, so the commander's taking this through. The commander's never thinking anything through. The commanders are fighting amongst themselves to, to get the power, you know, and being manipulated by other people to get, to do what they're told, and it's it's just chaotic. There's just a sense of, in this environment, yeah, a sense of people within a society that has become chaotic, and it's not as intellectual as they try and make out. It's like, it's kind of barbarism. It just feels very middle-aged influence, like, the idea that people can take other people's land quite easily through conquest is not out of the DNA of these people. It's something that they can instantly go to straight away. It's just in their build. So they're coming over to this other country. Not having a clue about it, but they're going to conquer it. And there's a great scene where they're going, this land is mine, this land is mine, as they go by the boats. And it's absurd and just how crazy they've got. It's just wonderfully crazy, and just wonderfully chaotic, you just feel a sense of dread. Well, it's funny as hell. I mean, the film I kind of link it to is The Shining, the sense of people slowly going mad and not admitting it to themselves, and a lot of it's really funny, and it shouldn't be, but it really is. I mean, they're kind of canon throughout, and it's just bogging them down the whole way through. Just keep the canon going, because they're scared of the natives around them. They're terrified of the natives, they... The human butchering natives then, they're always terrified of them, and the natives are picking them up one by one, it's like, what did you expect? And there's a wonderful bit where they, some of the where people get trapped somewhere, on a raft, and they can't get out of this shallow in the water. And Kinsky says, Kinsky tells says to one of his people, I think the can's a bit rusty, and the guy just thinks, okay, and he, obviously that's a conspiracy. He just tries it out and blows up the people on the other side. And it's just like, it's so brutal and so crazy, but it's wonderful and it shows you that sense of Kinski just being this malicious creature who's just doing everybody. And as the film goes on, he gets more and more crazy as more and more people die. And he seems to be like delighting in it. And by the end of it, he's in a boat with all these monkeys who are jumping around him and he just ranting into them because he's just absolutely crazy. I mean, he's been crazy from the start. It's like, it's always a guy you do not want on your team. He's crazy, he's malicious, he will take down anybody's in his way. He will, uh, if there's someone who's got seen ideas, he will destroy them so that a weak person who he can manipulate will get ahead. It's that kind of sense of, this is how these civilizations collapse in themselves because they, the smart people manipulated everyone so much that it was just a civil war half the time. And no, everyone was just after one little power base. It's just this creation of this fragile structure suddenly set into a mad area where none of the rules actually are protected by the landscape. It's just a wonderful film. It just genuinely is wonderful and genuinely insane. But in a good way, it's like the director knows what he's doing. And it just is this start of what Herzog could do. Like, like he can he understood nature versus unsentimental, nature doesn't care. Like, he can show human beings in nature, he can show what nature is. But he doesn't have any sentimentality about it, it's just, this is what it is. And you just fight at your own peril. And he likes showing the craziness of human beings and the obsessions of human beings. And how we're maybe not meant always for civilised life. How the civilizations kind of traps us and how a lot of people just try and go against that. Which, but he does a lot more subtle in other films. This one's the, the crazy, mad one, but this is the thing that everyone keeps on going back to because it's an easy story. Here's Werner Herzog doing another crazy story. And, it, and when you look at the films, it's not, it's not really about that. But he's been typed as that. Which is a shame because he's a, he's a wonderful director. He is really one of the best directors of his era. He just is... It did, I mean, the 70s stuff is just... A, Film after film of masterpiece after masterpiece. It's just non-stop. He was just doing great work all the time. And of course, because everyone was so enamoured by the you know, the new wave directors and the movie brats, I think he got underrated. I think a lot of German directors got underrated, but especially him, I think he really got underrated in a way that uh, was a shame because he was doing some really amazing stuff. So I hope this first introductory film by, by film Herzog interests you. I haven't done his debut Fat Morgana because I've been doing that as one of the debut film debut series films so 
That's why I haven't done that one. That's why I started with Aguirre after God. Just in case you're wondering. I, I am I am planning that one. So um hope you enjoyed the video. I'll be back soon with some more. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>